small green arrow shows the path of the star behind the plume. And as the star passes behind the plume, its starlight becomes dimmer, which allows us to measure the shape and the structure and also the composition of the plume. And as the star passes behind, we're able to turn this into a picture and a direct measurement of the environment of the plume very near the surface. So this is something that Cassini has not been able to do yet to penetrate into the heart of the plume, which is measured by watching a star that passes behind. If we go to the next slide, uh, we'll see an animation here. And this is an animation of what you would see from the Cassini spacecraft. That's the star Zeta Orionis, one of the stars in Orion's belt, passing behind the uh, plumes there. And we need the audio for this, if we could turn the audio up on that. And as you see, the star dims as it passes behind each of the jets in the plume. That sound you're hearing is like a tea kettle. We're watching steam come out of the southern pole of Enceladus. And each of the jets, if we go back one more time for the animation, please. If we go back, please, to the animation. If we could uh, step back to the animation, thank you. So as the, as the stars, Eta Orionis, passes behind, where the exiting gas is larger, the star dims, and we're able to measure, actually count, the number of molecules along the path to the star. And so this gives us the most detailed, the most detailed measurements of the physical properties of the jets near the surface. And here's an artist's conception in this graphic of the jets coming off of the surface of Enceladus. The blue line with the arrow that proceeds from right to left is the path of the star is projected onto the surface of Enceladus. And each of those little letters, A, B, C, D, is one of the times that we see the dimming of the star increase that shows us the presence of a small jet coming off the surface of Enceladus. And as you can see from this visual, our observations A, B, C, and D roughly line up with the jets that have been observed by the cameras, the same ones that were indicated by stars in John Spencer's last visual. So there's a consistent story here that the cameras are seeing jets of gas lifting small grains of ice from the surface of Enceladus, and we are able to match those observations by watching a star that passes behind the moon. The, uh, the next uh, visual here is not of Enceladus, but of the old faithful geyser at Yellowstone. So this is the best analogy we have on the Earth to the phenomenon that's occurring on Enceladus. Just like on Enceladus, water is shooting out of the surface of the moon. And uh, there are, however, a few differences between Old Faithful, the geyser on the Earth, and the geysers that we're seeing on Enceladus. On Enceladus, there is no atmosphere. The sky is black, full of stars. The jets are continuous and not liquid water, but water vapor, essentially steam. And the particles entrained captured in that water are small grains of ice, about one ten thousandth of an inch across. And so now, with the combination of the direct measurements, uh, the remote measurements, and the occultation by a star, we're getting a picture of the environment that's creating these jets on the surface of Enceladus. Water molecules ejected at over a thousand miles per hour, carrying small grains of ice, ten thousandth of an inch across, shooting hundreds of kilometers above the surface of the moon Enceladus. Fortunately, this gas and the small particles are not a danger to Cassini, and therefore we'll be able to use the spacecraft to go yet closer to the moon and do yet more detailed investigations. We see on Enceladus the three basic requirements for the 
origin of life. We see water, although it may not be liquid. We see organic compounds detected by the ion and neutral mass spectrometer. And we also have a source of heat indicated by the composite infrared spectrometer. These three basic ingredients are, provide a minimum for the origin of life. Now we don't yet see, nor can we tell or state whether the interior of Enceladus contains liquid water and if that water might be a habitat for life. But these are the questions that Cassini will focus on in our future flybys. The next of these in August and then more in October and in the following years to answer the question of what in the interior makes these jets and plumes which we see and what connection that might be to a possible habitation for life. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, simply amazing stuff. Um, now, I know that we have a lot going on and in the world of news today. Um, I don't have any questions from our NASA centers. We have some folks here. Does anyone have a question for anyone? Um, seeing, uh, seeing no hands, I want to remind folks that you can see this incredible data on www.nasa.gov and want to remind you all that on April 3rd, we will start a series of briefings for the Mars Phoenix lander scheduled to land on the red planet on May 25th. On April 3rd, we will start the briefing. Stay tuned for announcements on the time and location. I thank our participants again. Incredible news. Go to our website. And yes, you all know this. I say it and I mean it. Science never sleeps. Thanks for joining us.